Okay, great. All right, here we go. Uh, so, hi, my name is Carol with uh, deepmusic.ai, and today we're going to be interviewing composer and performer Dana Leong. He had um, commissioned, we had commissioned him to compose um, an AI assisted piece, and he not only composed it, he actually played multiple instruments um, and had to learn a new instrument as well to create a beautiful um, orchestral piece. So today we're going to be diving deep and asking him um, no question is off limits and we will chat about his creative process and um, and it'll just be a really free flowing conversation. So welcome Dana. Thank you so much uh, for Thank joining you. us today. <laughs> um, How's yeah. everything on your end? It's okay here out in uh, San Francisco and um, you're out in in Japan and it's great that technology can connect us and we could actually work quite closely. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. This is great. Yeah. Um, so first I just wanted, uh, for people who might not be familiar with you, um, who have just checked out your piece for the first time, I'd love to have um, you just talk about who you are and um, and just st maybe start with um, what you do and, and what is your philosophy for creating it as an artist. Absolutely. Oh, so uh, as you stated, I'm Dana Leong. I am a, a two-time Grammy award-winning musician and composer producer and uh, a member of the World Economic Forum's Young Global Leader Community, is, which is where we connected, uh, thankfully. And uh, my philosophy uh, with music is that uh, it should make you feel good and it should leave you with, uh, it should put you in a better place than you were before. And uh, I think no, no amount of exper experimentation and mixing uh, is off limits. Uh, <laughs> so that's why this was uh, an amazing uh, opportunity to uh, use a cloud-based AI platform uh, to collaborate together and compose something completely new. Uh, the piece that we created is called iDragon, and it is uh, has about... I want to say maybe about a hundred different tracks or layers, uh, which is uh, you know comprised of the traditional symphony orchestra, where you have you know sixteen violins, eight violas, uh, eight cellos, uh, four double basses. You have a full percussion section of you know timpanis and snare drums and uh, big uh, kind of symphonic tom toms. You also have timpani. I think I said timpani already. You have big cymbals. You have gongs. You have uh, marimbas. And uh, then you have a, a very, very uh, big kind of augmented brass, brass section. We have like maybe six trumpets, uh, four trombones, a bass trombone, uh, tuba, and uh, two French horns as well, or three French horns. Uh, let's see. And then on top of that, you have the electronic side of things. Uh, I think maybe some of the more popular uh, Examples along history were, uh, you know, something like Electric Light Orchestra uh, or modern day. You have people like uh, Woodkid uh, from France, who's a very famous uh, music video uh, producer who, who turned uh, into a actual artist himself. Uh, he was famous for producing a lot of uh, Madonna's videos and Pharrell Williams's videos and a lot of really, really uh, highly stylized and highly impactful, clear, ultra high definition beautiful, uh, beautifully cinematically shot music videos, but then he became his own artist. And uh, he typically has uh, a mixture of like you know, DJs and synthesizers and, and a traditional orchestra as well. So we kind of uh, are mirroring that model as well. So mm. we've got the big orchestra and then we've got the synthesizers and the drum machines and all the things that make things kind of more modernized and driven uh, in a kind of like more uh, hip hop uh, stylization. Uh, and so I think you wanted me to talk a little bit about how we started getting created or how we started creating. Uh, well, I'd love to hear, like, maybe if we go all the way back, just, yeah. you know, um, maybe hearing about, like, what your background is with technology and electronic instruments as well, uh, just to give the audience, like, a sense of, you know, how much experience you had going into this project and then maybe what your first thoughts were when... Um, like I approached you about this project. Was it something that was on your radar? Was it something that you were thinking about? Um, what were your expectations? Uh, so the my background with electronics is very uh, uh, trial and error based. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, 
uh, all, all, all the things I've learned with electronics were mostly self-taught. Uh, I got my first computer when I was in middle school. It was kind of a hand-me-down from a, a neighbor friend of ours, and it had some notation software in it, some very crude kind of vo voice uh, recording software uh, in, in it as well. And I, you know, just clicked through all the different uh, menus and, you know, all I could say is kind of monkeyed around with it uh, and, uh, you know, just tried to see what all the functions were. So I, I realized that uh, it had a very kind of uh, basic, the notation was like a predecessor to what I guess uh, later came for Apple was like Digital Performer, one of the very first kind of multi-track recording systems. But you could write music in uh, using either a piano roll or a uh, notation. So uh, since I had the, you know, the, uh, the upbringing going to music lessons and learning music theory and reading music, I was able to, you know, type in or, or kind of key in the songs that I knew off the top of my head. I mean, I was probably 10 years old. So you're talking about Christmas carols, happy birthday, you know, <laughs> whatever cartoon songs I was watching on Saturday morning cartoons, those kind of things. Uh, but the experimental nature of my brain has always asked the question, you know, what is the limit? I always try to figure out, like, very quickly, what is the limit, right? So how fast can it play or how slow can it play or how long can it hold a note or how many instruments can it can it, uh, uh, how many instruments can it reproduce the sound of that once? So, you know, I would click, you know, hundreds of notes and just listen to what what would come out. And a lot of times, you know, it would just be a giant mess, but it was interesting to see, okay, well, this thing can play happy birthday. You know, it takes me, you know, 10 seconds or 20 seconds to play it on my cello or on piano or, uh, but it can play happy birthday in, in one second. <laughs> uh, yeah. so I was always kind of curious and, 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 uh, you know, wanting to experiment in that, in that, uh, in that realm. So as, as soon as I found out any type of technology that could kind of, uh, become a hybrid world or bridge between, you know, what I learned with my acoustic instruments and what was happening in the computer world, I wanted to try it. Uh, you know, so early on I was trying to, uh, you know, hook my cello up to old crude, like, you know, Walkman tape recorders and see if I could, you know, get it to loop. And we hooked it up to answering machines. Uh, we, you know, kind of, I guess it's a, it's just like hackathon style, right? <laughs> circuit bending and, you know, reconnecting things. Uh, eventually we got into guitar pedals and, you know, uh, I got, uh, a piezo pickup that goes under the bridge for the cello. So then you could plug it into anything that you could plug a guitar into. And at that point, you know, a whole other world opened up. You could plug into the guitar pedals. And then eventually when I was in college, they started coming out with the first, uh, virtual technologies that were emulating old equipment. So I've got that big tape machine back there, uh, you know, that has a certain character and sound to it. We have a couple of sound processors here, back here, but that's all, that all became emulated through computer algorithms and software. Uh, around the mid 2000s and at that point I said oh wow that's amazing so now I can carry a laptop and get all the sounds of these vintage uh, kind of synthesizers and sound processing devices with my cello as the input of the sound uh, and I went crazy with that and you know for many years if you look at old recordings from you know 2000 to 2015 I was always you know with a laptop on stage because the cello was going the signal from cello is going into the laptop and then pre being processed or photoshopped if you if you want to say before it goes out uh, to the audience. Similar to the way that you know if you were to sing into a microphone in a studio, then you might doctor the sound and make it sound how you you know how you want it to sound or or uh, kind of a toy with it until it sounds like something that maybe a human voice doesn't even make, and then and then it goes out to the world. Right, so. I've always, like I said, I've always had a very uh, uh, experimental nature to uh, what I, uh, how I create. So when I met you and you told me that you were uh, working on advancing, uh, you know, the capabilities and the possibilities in the AI plus music realm, I was super excited uh, because it's something I had no experience uh, doing before. And I had checked out some of the very early iterations of, uh, uh, you know, like Beatles renditions and Bach renditions and, and things like that. Uh, but I learned so much uh, going through this, uh, going through this project, um, both by, uh, you know, your guidance and, you know, the things you were 
uh, the the pla- all the platforms that you short shared with me and ha- allowing me the opportunity to to test each one, uh, but also just kind of learning more about what's happening in the industry uh, and how AI is actually shaping the creation not only in the audio world but also in the visual world. I had no idea about that, and uh, that that to me is absolutely uh, uh, astounding. <laughs> the AI computers that you could say, hey, uh, draw me a picture of a bird, a lifelike picture, and it'll give you the most lifelike, high-definition picture of a bird or a sparrow or whatever that you've ever seen, right? And you can't, you cannot, uh, uh, you can't tell the difference. Yeah, no, it's amazing, like, just the amount of progress that has happened um, with artificial intelligence in the last, like, two, three years, or even just while we've, when we started this project a year ago, um, and just the number of companies and startups that have sprung up, not only in the music space, but also in the um, arts, the visual arts world. Uh, sure. And I, I do think it was extremely, like, I, I appreciate the time you took to play around with the different platforms. And I would love your thoughts, um, highs and lows or limitations, just whatever you noticed. You know, because um, you, you tried like three or four different platforms out there, and there's probably a total of like, roughly 12 or so companies that that have tools to be that are open source that can be used by professional artists. So I'd love to get your thoughts on when you actually tried them, uh, what you noticed, what impressed you, maybe what was more limited, because each tool is different and each team is different. So we can't make blanket statements. So I really, like I said, appreciate that you dug deep into each one and played with it to see if it matched your personal style. Yeah. So Oh, if, so if we've covered four and there's 12, then we, we, we still have some work. <laughs> there's more out there, so there's more songs to be had. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so you're right. If we go through them, let's see, one by one, there was the MuseNet, right? Yep. Yep. So Check MuseNet, there. I found. Autobot. Yeah, Music Autobot. Music Autobot, right? And uh, I we did a little bit of uh, kind of behind the scenes blogs which you guys might go through eventually and uh and pull some uh, initial reactions whatnot but uh from what i recall is that uh, all the platforms we tried it's apparent that they were made by people who who know about music which is a great start uh and uh i think the uh in terms of how comprehensive each each platform was uh, was the determining factor for how I ended up choosing which one to go with. Uh, because uh, just like when you you know make create an app, you need to know, or a video game or whatnot, you need to know a programming language. And for me, uh, the programming language of music that I know is the, tradi- the most traditional one. It's sheet music with a treble clef and a bass clef and you know the note, the black notes on the page. And I also know uh, the programming language of the cello fingerboard, right? I, I consider that to be just as much as an input as a, you know, a QWERTY keyboard, right? That's how I input the, the sound messages analog style to the cello itself, right? I don't mean to get super geeky about it, but <laughs> it is pretty much a, a language, right? And, and piano is another language as well. So I know that uh, on a basic level. So, uh, however, a lot of producers nowadays are using what's called a piano roll, which is actually based on a, on a technology that's about 100 years old when they used to have those player pianos in the, in the saloons in the wild, wild west. What they would do is they would poke these, they would perforate these holes in a, in a roll of paper and then they would spin it back and just like a music box, it would tell the piano and the motor on the piano which note to trigger and when. Uh, and a lot of producers actually use that as their method of inputting notes today, like, you know, the most famous producers in the world, actually, you know, you get people like Diplo and Skrillex and, you know, uh, something like Avicii, Rest His Soul, Zed, all the, all the guys that make like a million dollars a night as DJs and producers, they're just clicking these boxes and, you know, it looks a lot like, a uh, little, little bit like Guitar Hero, right? Mm-hmm. Braille, it looks like Braille. <laughs> uh, but I prefer to use notation because it's just what I learned and so, uh, that is what made me land on using Ava uh, because you had the most flexibility on what you can actually, uh, how you can communicate with the program and uh, the, I guess the terms, like the, the language that it uses, like uh, it was very, uh, like I said, comprehensive. Uh, you could, uh, basically what you would do is you could feed the program 
uh, a musical sample, uh, a song or uh, a, a MIDI file, and then you could ask the AI to then create its own kind of a interpretation of of that style, right? And sort of extract what it thinks are the key uh, elements of that style. Uh, so we put in, you know, one of my previous orchest orchestral arrangements, uh, or orchestrations of a uh, uh, Chinese folk song called Heirs of the Dragon. And we asked it to create something that kept the same number of instruments, uh, about roughly about the same tempo. Mm -hmm. And then from there, uh, try to extract the stylistic qualities, but create something completely uh, brand new from there. Right. The most, like I said, that was the most comprehensive one. Uh, there were other ones, like, like we said, with Autobot and MuseNet, uh, where the songs that you started with to influence the AI uh, where it was sort of like a jukebox where you could only choose a certain number of songs. Uh, but we wanted to really be able to actually use something from my own catalog so that we could train the AI to actually analyze my style of, of, of songwriting and orchestration. Uh, and also uh, the instrumentation, which includes uh, electronic plus a symphony. Mm. Right? So some of those other ones were a lot more... Uh, I'm not quite sure what the uh, uh, what the target audience is for those because they're more kind of like it's more like an exhibition that you find in a museum where you're like press this button and you'll learn about you know rocks from one million years ago and it'll tell you you know and and except maybe each time you press a button you get a different result right. I see. Uh, so yeah, we want more control over like the number of instruments to be able to limit it. So I know that um, MuseNet, you can upload your own custom file um, and then choose a certain influence that goes over it or um, or like choose like you want string instruments. But I don't think it ties any sort of number of instruments. Uh, didn't have number of instruments. I don't know that you were also able to edit whatever came out on the other end. Uh, yeah. Whereas the Ava was spitting out a MIDI file that you could put into your computer and open up in whatever music editing software you have and then start, you know, molding that, uh, which is very powerful because then you can, you know, you can change the, you know, say you have a hundred different instruments, but you can, you can change what kind of clarinet you want or what kind of uh, tuba sound you want or what kind of timpani sound or what kind of symbol, right? Do you want a Chinese symbol that sounds like a gong? Do you want a, you know, a trash can symbol that sounds like, you know, downtown New York bang on a can? Do you want, uh, you know, a jazz symbol from the 1960s, right? You can change all that. Uh, and so that's a lot more powerful of a, of an option when you're, when you're uh, producing and creating and kind of, you know, tailor making the music uh, versus, uh, you know, the other ones where, you know, maybe you could take a popular song by a very popular artist uh, and then create a, a completely new piano piece, right, based on that. I, th I think I did something on a Disney platoon. I think I did something on a Adele song as well. Okay. Uh, uh, but those uh, were, I think some of them were also limited, like you said, to just one one instrument. Gotcha. Great. I would love to hear your, like, when you started on this project, what was, what were your envisioning for like what is your creative process did you had chosen one of your previous pieces did you want a chinese folklore uh style was that or folk style was that what you were going for um like well, how did like i guess your original concept did it get shaped once you started working with the yeah with the collaborative partner so uh one of the things we've been doing with our uh, with our tectonic symphony, uh, which is an electronic hybrid symphony, uh, is cr is taking uh, uh, kind of like national treasured folk songs, nationally treasured folk songs, and remixing them into the modern electronic realm. Uh, so, because that's not, you know something that we're constantly working on, I've developed a kind of workflow process for that. And my original goal, uh, it's funny, actually, I, I ended up watching uh, uh, one of your husband Andrew's interviews uh, in between the last time we spoke and now. And it's funny, I think we share a, a philosophy in that the first key kind of milestone for AI 
is being able to uh, is being able to simplify kind of arduous tasks uh, that that maybe you wouldn't want to do or you wouldn't even want to give your intern right like if you had a hard drive full of photos uh, and okay I want to find every photo in this you know hard drive of 20, the last 20 years of my photos that have a basketball in them right I mean it could take you years but I AI could do it in seconds right mm -hmm. so uh, when I create music I have to set up a template that has all 100 instruments uh, I have to pick the tempo I have to then pick the key uh, and all that is very time consuming uh, especially when you have so many instruments right if you were like I said use happy birthday again as the example if you're going to play happy birthday or write it down on a sheet of paper that may take you a few seconds but if you were to write it for a hundred piece symphony that might take you a few hours right yeah. so well uh, it's true like the limit of like where AI is today it's it's it the a good rule of thumb is that it can do what a human would be able to do in like less than a second but it can do it extremely fast and through like massive amounts of data so it's Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so great. Yeah. So you, what did you have automated? Um, uh, so what we did is we asked it to identify uh, all of the instruments mm -hmm. in the or orchestration and then create a file that had all those already baked into it. So then when we pulled that MIDI file out of Ava and brought it back into the Ableton uh, environment or, or uh, uh, composing and recording software, they all popped up, right? And everything was just right there as I said you know like I said before four uh, six trumpets you know four trombones a bass trombone a tuba 16 violins blah, 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 blah. all that stuff was all written out and already already right in front of us uh, so that did save us uh, you know so, some time uh, what I was really hoping you know is, is probably a little bit beyond us right now at the moment I was hoping that it would really kind of capture kind of the essence of like uh, you know melody writing and the and the essence of uh of uh of really taking that melody as like you know if you ima if you imagine a melody as a thread and then you imagine the orchestration as a tapestry i was hoping that it would be able to really kind of uh spin multiple variations on that first thread and 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 it can but again i think we touched on this uh, topic and analogy in our last chat, it you know, we're still a little bit a ways away before you see an AI spin, you know, a tapestry as beautiful as a you know a, a Persian rug you see in downtown New York at ABC Carpet. Right? Uh, it it will surprise you, which is good, and that's actually a lot of times what I was looking for is uh, when it when it came up with kind of. Uh, unusual ways to to arrange instrument instrumentation uh and unusual ways to uh to compose for certain instruments uh in our piece we have color coded where the ai was you know had composed and where the human had composed uh and there's certain like you know violin sections where there's like these chords of violins and they're in threes and you know uh, having grown up playing in an orchestra, I never think to actually write these like triad chords with three notes because when you look at orchestra, there's always two people sitting at every music stand. And whenever they split the uh, whenever they split things where you're supposed to play a chord, they'll usually only write two notes because one person sitting on the left side of the, of the music stand will play one note, and one person sitting on the right stand, side of the music stand will play the other note. And when you have three, you actually have to go through the orchestra and say, okay, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, and it gets confusing. But there is really no musical reason why you shouldn't do it, because mm -hmm. you know we all have sat at a piano probably before and played three notes that sound good together. Uh, so I like that because it brings you out of your comfort zone, right? And bring and and I think if anything in this last year, I've learned to sit with what is uncomfortable and do what is uncomfortable, uh, because we have the time and we have the uh, we don't have another option, right? <laughs> if we're not disciplined and moving forward during the most kind of insanely. Uh, frustrating times 
then what are we doing, right? We're just, we're just giving up. Right? So so I, I like that. I was like, oh, this is interesting. Okay, we're getting some some strange stuff that we wouldn't usually get. So let's work with this. Let's. So sit. totally, it sounded fine. Um, what about when you were actually performing it? Like, did you keep did you keep the AI as it as it had spit out exactly as it was written and like? So my process actually, what I did with the. Uh, and with the iDragon is we took the original orchestration and we basically spun the uh, wheel of fortune seven times. Mm -hmm. So because it was so fast, I said, oh, yeah, you know, and because uh, each time we spun that wheel and said, OK, create a new piece that's you know three minutes long, that's this fast, that's this key, that's, you know, this many instruments, it would give us uh, the piece in, I want to say, less than a minute. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. incredible, right? And, and And it could take a human you know, hundreds of hours to, to create this. And so I said, oh, uh, because I don't hear a straight go through that I'm completely satisfied with, uh, coupled with uh, the fact that it's so fast, I was like, OK, let's just do seven of them. Yeah. And then we'll, we'll, we'll cut parts of each one and put them into the final. You kind of weaved your Persian rug yourself from these seven pieces because um, none of them were like strong on their own, like the structure started falling. Okay. It, you know, it, it, wasn't, okay. it wasn't strong. I think like, like I said, I could, I could, when I would listen to it, I could actually hear the influences. Sometimes I was like, oh, this is interesting. I can hear the, like, for example, like the kind of like romantic era style of orchestration where you may double a clarinet with a French horn and a viola. Right. The sections all together because and, and, you know, because they all have this kind of heavy mid uh, uh, kind of throaty mid tone in their in their texture. And, you know, if you were to read orchestration books, like you would find that kind of thing and then, you know, find Brahms or find, you know, uh, Beethoven, these kind of like a great uh, classical masters of orchestration, like the ways that they kind of, you know, their recipes in orchestration. And so. I could hear that and I was impressed. I was like, oh yeah, I didn't, I wouldn't even have thought of that unless I went back to my old like kind of college texts and like looked at the orchestration books all over again. Uh, but you, you're right in terms of like, is this like a three course meal I want to sit through? Maybe not. There's a couple bites that are good here and there, but mm -hmm. overall it's like, it's, it's following the rule, but following the rules doesn't always mean you're going to, you know, come up with the, uh, you know, something that, that touches you, yeah. you know? Yeah. Great. Uh, and then I, just to get real tactical, I would love to hear, like, did you actually have, like, as you were taking the pieces from these uh, different seven um, outputs, did you actually alter any of the notes or did you just actually take the section in totality? Or did you actually have to change some of the our, our color key on, on the on the iDragon video uh, shows, I think it was purple, blue and green mm -hmm. and i think that the unspoken rule i was looking at is trying to only add uh only add on top of what's there okay. so uh i did not uh alter the i guess the thread i just cut mm -hmm. you know like a hip-hop producer would you know you kind of cut bits and pieces and then put them in different uh, in different places, right, throughout the song. Uh, however, the segments, there are longer segments, you know, five to 10 seconds, uh, 20 seconds that are completely created by the, the AI. But I, you know, uh, at the time of our creation, I believe Ava did not include uh, a library of, of, of uh, a very, a very uh, kind of a, uh, com not complete, but like a, a, a robust uh, library of drum sounds. Uh, so uh, th those we had to create ourselves uh, and, you know, in order to keep, keep it like a beat driven, uh, more kind of cinematic uh, hip hop type of sound. But uh, uh, like I said, yeah, we were only adding. So I would say, OK, this is an interesting passage. How can we frame this right in a way that uh, you know, really kind of utilizes the full orchestra. Wonderful. And then how did you backfill in the human composed piece? 
so it sounds like you started with just the AI, um, the seven pieces, and then you created kind of like the structure of your piece from those seven, and then you backfilled with uh, like the the other notes in the orchestra, or did you? Um, Sometimes when I compose, uh, I look at it. I don't know. If, I don't know if authors ever do this or whatnot, or, or pl- I think maybe people in musical theater or playwrights might do this. But I actually kind of think of things like more in like a table of contents first. Mm-hmm. And then I go in and fill in the details of what what's in each chapter. So this is a very short piece, right? It's three minutes. But within the piece, you have probably m- maybe four or five distinct sections. And so I'd already been thinking about that. Okay, well, I want to use this segment, but it doesn't sound like an opener or a closer. It's more of a developing section. So, okay, let's put this, let's Im- let's imagine this segment of the violin trio, you know, uh, triads somewhere building up in the middle. Uh, and then, uh, you know, at the very end, uh, oh, oh, I heard some very interesting kind of like, you know, very elephant-like, like, uh, uh, like low kind of uh, stomps from the tubas and the basses. And, you know, uh, it reminded me a lot of, uh, like, you know, John Williams and Jurassic Park and these kind of like very heavy bottomed uh, ensembles. I said, oh, this would be good for the end, right? Uh, To really kind of like stomp our way home, right? And so that's sort of how I first looked at everything. I took took all the fragments and said, okay, where are these going to, where are these going to best fit? almost like a uh, like a collage right and then once we had kind of idea of where each one would go within that three minutes and how many distinct you know chapters or sections uh of the song it would be then we start to fill in you know okay how do we actually create a transition between this and this we don't want to just say you know flip a coin and like all of a sudden we're at a new section and you know it'd be a little bit too uh you know abrupt yeah yeah and that's where you so as the human composer you smoothed through the transition um awesome great and then uh would love to hear you know like what how this process might be different than your current process and also like what where did you hit maybe limits with the ai like if I, i know um the software platforms are constantly updating and they even released like the new i think like the drum beats just this last week um that's right but but i would love to just hear you know like if you had a list of features or you know to talk to talk directly with the ai scientists what would what would be your top few asks that you would love to see incorporated mm-hmm. in the software um where, where should they focus mm-hmm. uh or, so, you, so or even to... ease of use i guess mm-hmm. all three like the, the user uh-huh. interface we were talking about uh, so in a lot of times in creativity, artists will pride themselves on what they can do that's original. Mm-hmm. So uh, I think this is a unique tool because it allows you to do exactly that. When I press that button, you know, that go button, and I got those seven, you know, kind of data sets, as you said, uh, they were completely different from each other. And they were completely different from the original. And they're completely different than anything that's ever existed. As far as I know, I think the thing is trained not to plagiarize, right? So (laughs) just spit out something completely new. And so that's great, because we live in a world where, uh, I forgot which producer was saying this, but he, we, but, but he was saying we live in a world where we're now getting to the point where we're hearing samples of samples, right? Like when you listen to somebody like, uh, you know, like uh, Kanye West and, and people are like, wow, let's listen to that, you know, that kind of chipmunk sounding voice that's singing high and the vibrato is very fast. And, and you think, oh, wow, that's a kind of an interesting sound. But actually, that might be a sample of another song that sampled a song from, you know, 1960s, uh, you know, uh, uh, Chaka Khan or whoever else is, you know, these soul, soul singers are, right? So it's interesting if you, it, you know, a lot of times, like I said, creatives, I said use the word creatives because I mean in fashion, in culinary, in visual arts, painting, graffiti, uh, you know, uh, 
design. Uh, people pride themselves on saying, you know, this is my fingerprint and this is my work and this is my original creation. Uh, even if they're working with, you know, threads and materials that other people can also access. Uh, specifically, you know, even when you buy an Apple computer, you've got GarageBand and it comes with, you know, hundreds of thousands, thousands of samples of, you know, different drums and different sounds. And, uh, you know, it's actually quite easy, believe it or not, to actually for for two completely unrelated people to to arrive at the exact same thing with the because they're using the exact same ingredients. Right. And the ingredients are big. It's not like you're you're, you're creating with granules of salt and granules of sugar and and, and, and you know, and, and the working in the finite space of, you know, kind of almost like a chemistry like space like a baker does. Right. Where you you miss a tiny bit of baking soda or or vanilla extract and your whole cake is just done. Right. It's different uh, with with these, uh, you know, kind of like sample packs that you buy on the Internet or that you buy with your computer. You know, they've got these long loops that are, you know, they could become entire songs, right? So, like I said, having something that is unique in the universe is actually quite cool uh, and 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 great that that this exists. So it's a great tool. Uh, we had mentioned in our in our uh, kind of composer dialogue that uh, I think that this is great for people like uh, who are enthusiasts that want to get into music and the and the bar is a little bit uh, maybe it feels a little bit intimidating to just go you know, to a, to a online school or go, you know, to a teacher and start from scratch. Uh, this, the bar of entry is a little bit lower where you can kind of work with these tools and, and, uh, depending on which platform you work with, you can use what you know about creativity and your ability to describe music and actually get something back as opposed to having to just think of something from, from thin air and then somehow mechanic mechanically put it, put it together yourself. Uh, in terms of what we would like to see from the platforms, that's a good question. That is a very good question. I think that uh, we 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 kind of talked about this, uh, you know, before the call. That AI is something that gets better as it gets more training, and you know, way easier said than done. But you know, the more uh, the more input and influences it can get from, uh, you know, some of our favorite composers, songwriters, orchestrators, music arrangers, uh, the better it will, the better it will get, right? Mm -hmm. I put out something that, uh, that we, uh, that we want to work with. Uh, so I don't know how, how, how can we accelerate that? Yeah, I know it's tough. Um, you know, it, it's, 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 I'm, I'm an advocate for more transparency in the data sets. Um, there's like a huge movement for data sheets for data sets so that we know, you know, not just the hours that it's trained on, but like where the from. And it plagiarizes these things. That that's a whole other topic that will come up um, relatively shortly in the future um, as we infringe on artist rights and everything. Um, but you know, I would, I, as you I, as a human. I went to, a, I went to a, a, a friend of ours, uh, I went to his office and he said, hey, have you ever seen an AI human? I said, no, I haven't. He said, all right, let me show you a, uh, an AI human. I was like, okay. And he showed me this baby. Maybe you've seen this already, but it was, a, it was you know, an infant baby. Uh, and he said, yeah, 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 go ahead, sit here and talk with the baby and, uh, you know, play with it. And it was, you know, it was staring at a computer screen and on the other side it was a, you know, semi lifelike looking baby uh and i started he was like he's like yeah say something i was like okay hello and like you know baby didn't do anything baby was just being a baby and then i was like okay like you know trying to make it entertain it like wave my hands and you know trying to make it laugh and it just you know just kind of just sitting there like a like a like a like a pile of flesh right <laughs> with a heartbeat and uh and eventually i said well hey how, how long is this gonna take and he's like Oh, it might take you years. I mean, it's a baby. <laughs> I've not seen this, but um, yeah. And, and hopefully, AI will learn faster than humans do. Um, but I would love to hear about because you know, like I think humans, each artist has different experiences and different ways that they want to express their their thoughts and their intentions. Um, 
and it's made up of your own life experiences. I would love to hear who your musical influences are because it's great talking to you. And, you know, I, I hear um, like you pulling from your historical um, favorites, like you've talked about pop music, you've talked about hip hop music. I would love to hear what artist influences you and also, uh-huh. you know, influences a song or, you know, where, where you want to shape yourself as an artist. Like, because you kind of cross a lot of different genres, which is great. Yeah. Uh, I made a uh, made a kind of a, I guess, like a, a little statement and a reaction uh, a few months back. Uh, one of my very fa- favorite musicians and uh, biggest influences is a, is a pianist named Keith Jarrett. Uh, I think it's un- undeniable that he's a fantastic musician. Uh, he's one of the very few musicians in the world that is equally at home, you know, uh, playing in a classical concert hall as well as, you know, a uh, you know theater or a jazz club with with any of the greatest musicians uh, of all time. Uh, and uh, he made a statement in a New York Times article uh, last year, just a couple of months ago, saying that he doesn't anticipate to perform anymore because he had a couple uh, health challenges, I had some strokes, and, and he thinks that uh, he can only really fully utilize one hand and uh, as a perfectionist, and uh, I'll tell you this, uh, you know, this is why you don't ever want to be a perfectionist, because uh, I was told this a long time ago, and it really stuck with me. If you're a perfectionist, you seek perfection as it exists in your own eyes, and once you arrive at that level or that place, then you no longer continue to evolve, because you feel somehow in your own sense that you have reached a level of perfection. And, you know, as much as I love Keith and, I, and, I, and I've analyzed a lot of his uh, uh, recordings and performances and I've transcribed a lot of his, uh, his, mu- his music because there's no sheet music for a lot of the uh, performances that he's, that he's improvised or that he's, uh, uh, that he's played along the years. And I had a big, thick paper stack when I was in college because I would just go and, you know, write these down and then I would learn them on other instruments, on the cello and on the trombone and... Uh, and that actually helped me also to have a a different approach uh, and a, I guess you could say a different uh, style of driving or a different voice on the musical instruments because my influence was not only from, you know, the wonderful library and, and existence and history of, of, of cello players or trombone players or trumpet players or whatnot. It, it was a kind of like uh, we were talking about input languages, right? His input language was the, the 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 keyboard of the piano, and mine was the cello. And I had to find ways to translate what he was doing with with ten fingers into just you know four fingers and a thumb. Uh, he's a huge influence. Uh, I think that his level of uh, his 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 way of thinking as he performs is, I see it a lot. I see a lot of similarities and parallels between his playing and the way that Bach composed. Uh, the way that Mozart uh, performed and composed. There is a, uh, the only way to describe it, I think a lot of music theorists will say, there's a symmetry to a lot of the way, the, the ways that he performs and plays and improvises. The ways that, you know, he will start a, sen- a musical sentence and he will finish it. And it's very kind of satisfying in a way, right? <laughs> if you have any sort of like ADD whatsoever, it's very satisfying to have, uh, you know, any semblance of, of symmetry, right? One and one, right? Here it is. It's starting, it goes up, it, it climaxes and comes back down and it, and it resolves, right? Uh, two, his, his uh, sense of rhythm is very, like I would, I would like to say it's very high resolution. To some, it feels very fluid, but I feel like actually he, even though he may be playing fluid, he has an idea of where the bigger sense of time is, right? Uh, some of they say some of the greatest drummers, you can ask them to play a beat by themselves in a room with no computer equipment whatsoever, you know, for an hour. And if you measured them with a metronome in another room, they would be like fractions of a second off by the end of an hour. And that's what I mean when you when when I when I say he has a a very good high resolution sense of rhythm and a, and a good sense of the time overall, right? Has it been five minutes? Has it been one minute? Has it been an hour, right? I think that he's got that. Uh, so uh, beyond that, 
I do listen to a lot of uh, uh, electronic music, and uh, I'm fascinated because everybody's using the same tools, and everybody's discovering different ways to use those tools. So, uh, and now people are coming from all corners of the world. So, you know, you've got these very interesting kind of uh, takes on how to use like a tool like Ableton, right? People have found ways to, you know, connect it to lights, connect it to video, uh, to control all sorts of different uh, digital and uh, yeah. uh, instruments. So I'm, I'm listening to a lot of the, uh, the uh, everything from the, the super, you know, uh, commercial things like I mentioned Diplo and, you know, Skrillex and, you know, the Zeds and these, these guys, uh, uh, I'm impressed with those guys because also they, they can play instruments as well. So they, they're, they kind of speak the same language as I do where they, you, you know, they have, uh, uh, a traditional musical training and, uh, kind of a, a, a way of composing that also follows the, the, I guess the traditions of harmony uh like textbook traditions of harmony but they're 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 creating new uh they're spinning in new directions and that's something i also wanted to hear from the ai uh i wanted to hear more surprising stuff mm -hmm. i don't know how that can happen uh but uh there must be a way there must be a way uh there's a there's a dj out there uh producer uh named spongle and he's kind of in this very psychedelic kind of hippie uh, electronic jam music scene. But when you listen to his music, there's a lot of kind of undescribable sounds that that give you, uh, they give you physical sensations. Uh, I, I can't describe it. You have to just go and listen. Like, you know, it's a, it's, it's a very psychedelic experience. Like you start to, you know, feel altered in some way, almost like a synesthesia, but uh, something, a physical reaction. And I know that he spends a lot of time toying with these, you know, these old vintage synthesizers and making these sounds that kind of bubble and gurgle and these sounds that, uh, you know, they, they, they just distort your sense of reality. <laughs> and that's what I want to, that's also a realm I would like for the AI to, to explore more into. Obviously, it's easy to create something that sounds chaotic, uh, but to, sound some, to have something that actually has, I want to say a calculated uh, reaction, but 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 a uh, intentional reaction, uh, a, a, a re an intentional alteration of your psyche, mm -hmm. something that's very interesting to me. Yeah. yeah um just to go back a little bit, did, so did those seven pieces that um, were supposed to be influenced by your original piece, did they sound like what you would have created or was it? Oh. Uh, no. no did and did the final sound? Okay. Okay. And, did, and did, did the final piece sound like you? Would, would that have been something that you would have created if? I hope uh, we'll 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 have our our community and our audiences be the judge. <laughs> it sound like something that's completely out of character, completely out of left field, completely brand new. Uh, I think it has strong. I think we said this before, but it 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 is a collaboration, right? You got half, at least half of the material created by a thinking, reacting computer, and the rest created by a human. Uh, so with any collaboration, you have, you know, spices from both sides and you have ideas from both sides. Uh, and I think that unlike, unlike, unlike some collaborations, with this collaboration, the intention was to be democratic and to allow both voices to be heard. Okay. So I think that you will uh, notice that is something that is different than what I would normally create for sure. But because I'm still there pushing, you know, pushing buttons and playing the instruments, uh, I think the fingerprints are still pretty, uh, pretty apparent as well. Great. Yeah. Um, and then one final question I have for you is just, um, you know, with 
the future of um, AI, your thoughts on, you know, working again with uh, AI software as it continues to develop? Um, is that something that you're interested in to keep exploring? Um, you know, would you recommend working out with other artists? Um, you know, your thoughts on just the future of AI in the artistic process and what it, what it might have surprised you about yourself and your 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 style. Without a doubt, I'd like to continue delving in further and exploring in in the realm. Uh, as you said, that you know the the uh, I think what you're implying also is that you know as the computers learn and get smarter, they also leverage what you know their their own strengths. So they will continue to accelerate, uh, not on a flat linear curve, but on a you know on a ramped curve in terms of you know, how fast they'll start to learn and evolve. So I would love to be there and, and continue to, uh, you know, uh, work with it as, as it, as it uh, you know, hits this ramp and kind of just takes off. Uh, I'm a fan of mixed medium work as well. So I'm always curious, like, how does this affect, uh, you know, working with other uh, artists that are in other realms and other, other, uh, other practices, right? How is this going to affect the visuals realm? Uh, how is this going to affect the, you know, the the world of dance, or uh, you know, and how can we bring them all together? Uh, and 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 that is uh, something that's very interesting to me, right? Or how how is it going to work uh, as uh, you know performances are and and creations are brought into new, uh, for lack of for lack of a better term, new venues, right? As they're going bringing go, bringing them into the virtual space. Uh, into uh, spaces uh, that are, how would you say, uh, multiple dimensions, uh, like where there's, you know, a, a 3D dimension, 4D dimension, you know, 8D sound, whatever you want to call it, right? Spatial, uh, uh, ambisonic sounds, right? The world of VR. Like, how how is that going to actually, uh, uh, how is this all going to evolve? And I'm I'm so happy that we're here at this time to find out. Yeah, that's great. Um, and it, one final thought as we go through, what is um, important to you as a human composer to, like, what do you most enjoy about your job that you would hope to keep? And then a second follow-on question is, you know, just zooming out as an artist who does many different things, you know, how has technology, uh, in, like, impacted your life? Like, what what do you use it for in general? Not just AI, but just technology in general. And um and help amplify your voice and everything. So I'd love to hear just what is precious to you as an artist and what do you enjoy? And also the role that technology has in your life. You know, uh, the, the uh, life and role of a creative or an artist, uh, for me, the best part is the ability to to improve the way people feel we all have our go-to songs or playlists or whatnot that 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 evoke certain emotion whether it's uh you know whether it's we want to be in that kind of like sad you know self self-loathing space as we you know go through something uh or we want to be in that kind of you know uh courageous like amped up place you know you need your hype song before you get on that stage and you make your big speech right we all have different songs you know the anthems of our lives uh and the best part is being able to be at that kind of uh be 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 in the kitchen be in the kitchen cooking that right and and know that that there are times where you do where you do improve someone's life that's 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 the best part of all absolutely uh in terms of uh how does technology uh how does technology affect my life oh my god it, well it's a double-edged sword I've been coming to this remote region uh, in the Nagano Prefecture in Japan for, I want to say maybe five, six years now. And I used to come during the winter times when it's just super cold and snowing and uh, and there's nothing to do. Uh, and I would compose and sort of reset myself. 
right? And kind of try to turn off as many distractions as possible. However, like I said, it's a double-edged sword because uh, Japan is off is is very uh, plentifully laid out with fiber optic cable, mm. <laughs> and that allows you to see and connect with the rest of the universe at lightning speed, which is convenient, but it's also distracting as hell. <laughs> and during a time like this, where it's, you know, anything you want to search for, you're going to find. Like, if you want to find things that say XYZ president is the worst, you're going to find it. But at the same time, if you want to search the exact same opposite, you'll find articles printed on the exact same day you know, by different platforms that say the exact same opposite, you know, the, the exact opposite, you know, XYZ president is the greatest, right? And so I think during a time like this where we're in extended uh, lockdowns and extended periods of time where things are so uncertain, you know, technology can sometimes be, uh, I don't want, mm, how would I say it? It can sometimes be tormenting tormenting that's what it can be right uh it can also be confusing right and i and i'm mainly getting at you know when when you're when you're stuck looking at the news or you know you're looking at other cities just to try to see you know is there some glimmer of hope or there's people doing things that look fun in another place and if they are why are they doing it i'm not right? <laughs> <laughs> then your mind just starts spinning but yeah technology is is uh is tough but Consumer technology and prosumer technology and professional technology is it is absolutely a huge part of my life. Uh, you know, I love cameras. I'm always trying to uh, you know figure out how to take a better photo, how to take a better video, uh, how to light a scene better. Uh, this year, I've practiced a lot on editing. So uh, you know, the fact that you have all these tools, you know, at your fingertips uh, for a reasonable price is is also uh, really, really uh, fantastic. It's a great time to be alive. And, you know, I'm thankful for uh, all those uh, wonderful, uh, you know, e-commerce platforms that are able to deliver the technology <laughs> to my remote area of the world. It's true. That's been extremely helpful this year. And I'm really glad that we're also able to connect on opposite sides of the world to sure. be able to put this project together and then also talk um, and hear all your thoughts. You know, I, I, I love how I Dragon came out. I'm super impressed that you not only composed and performed it, but also f edited and um, and did the whole music video. And not just one, but you've got another world premiere coming out with the full music video this week as well. So that's right. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So just the whole creative aspect, Dana, you're encapsulating like what it is to be a true artist, and the song um, is phenomenal. So we'll definitely. Be, be linking it through and you have to listen to it um, again and again. So thank you so, so much for your time and also for sharing your thoughts. It, it's insightful for me just to hear what ha happened behind the scenes. Um, and I'm really glad to, to see you continue on the, the AI um, assisted uh, composition path and look forward to collaborating again and also seeing other pieces come out. Without a doubt. Yeah, it's been a pleasure to 